Well, as you've already noticed from the pictures I've shown of, uh, just flip back to them, uh, Kingsley, Ruskin, and Stephen, manliness for the Victorians was expressed physically, among other things, in the form of beards and moustaches, which characterised virtually all the great Victorian men, from uh, the poet laureate, Alfred Lord Tennyson, down to the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury. Beards, as the earlier illustration of the poet Shelley suggested, just flip back to Shelley, here we are, beardless. Beards were not the fashion in the early decades of the 19th century. Indeed, both Ruskin and Kingsley grew their beards relatively late in life. Here they are in the 1850s, beardless, though beginning to sprout at the edge of the face, as you can see. And here's a photograph of Leslie Stephen, roughly the same time. Again, he's entirely beardless. <coughs> it's worth pausing, pausing for a moment to consider the significance of the rise and fall of the Victorian beard. And it can tell us more than you might think at first glance about the nature of gender, that is, of masculinity in this case in particular, and more generally, masculinity and femininity in Victorian Britain. Now, beards became common, not, uh, as is often thought and was maintained by G.M. Trevelyan, not from the Crimean War in homage to the bearded heroes returning to the front, returning bearded because they hadn't been able to shave. Uh, but, in fact, uh, they were already in fashion by the time, and from the late 1840s at the latest. Already in 1852, Tate's Edinburgh Magazine announced, already the martial moustache, the haughty imperial, the daily expanding whiskers like accredited heralds proclaim the approaching advent of the monarch Beard. The centuries of his banishment are drawing to their destined close, and the hour and the man are at hand to re-establish his ancient reign. And as Christopher Oldstone Moore has remarked in a very interesting recent article on the Beard movement in Victorian Britain, beards up to this point have been a sign of political or cultural unconventionality, what he says, the property of artists and chartists. But now, following the collapse of the chartist movement and the defeat of the first European revolutions in 1848, beards became respectable, became politically, socially okay to wear a beard. Why shave? Was the article, of, uh, an article uh, in, uh, in Charles Dickens' Household Words in the mid-50s. So followed by the essay in defence of the beard, by James Ward, and an anonymous tract entitled The Beard. Why do we cut it off? Now, this trend, you might think, had something to do with technology, but in fact defied it, as more and more men spurned the advantages brought by William Henson's invention of the safety razor in 1847. Here's his diagram. Indeed, Beard, uh, uh, Henson, himself, though uh, he invented this uh, and tried to uh, sell it, uh, made relatively little use of his own invention. <coughs> now, why did he and so many other Victorian gentlemen opt for a life without shaming? Well, as says May Wingfield Stratford in a, a debunking book worthy to stand alongside Lytton Strachey's, called in this case Those Earnest Victorians, published in 1930, speculated, <coughs> there is perhaps, he wrote, some connection between aggressive manliness and the almost equally aggressive hairiness flaunted by the male sex at this time. And indeed, the beard, a signifier of manliness, accompanied the rise of organised sports at the same time, reaching a peak in the 1870s, when a statistical survey, and you might conclude that historians doing this kind of thing might have something better to do, it's actually rather interesting, statistical survey has recently concluded that half the men whose pictures appeared in the illustrated London news carried a full beard. I can't help imagining the historian here sitting and flipping through the pictures in the library with one beard and no beard, so on. So, so, about half of them. So anxious did young men become if they had difficulty in growing a full beard that inevitably unscrupulous businessmen began to offer potions for sale such as the beard generator, which guaranteed success within four to six weeks, even by young men not above 17 years of age. 
perfectly harmless for the skin. Uh, it's uh, Italian, I think, um, in origin, sold in Germany uh, and imported into Victorian England. It uh, shows you before on the left and after on the right. The epitomes of manliness in mid-century were the soldier and the medieval knight. And in both cases, facial hair was present. The magnificent moustaches of Napoleon's old guard were widely admired in retrospect, while the fashion for medieval chivalry led artists like Lanzia to show knights as bearded. And in preparation for the Eglinton Tournament of 1839, a famous event, a pseudo-medieval event put on, uh, where and the knights dressed, dressed, people dressed up as knights in armour, uh, people actually, men actually grew beards or moustaches to appear authentic, and in some cases uh, kept them on. Afterwards, you can just about see this in the contemporary illustration by James Henry Nixon. Some of these men are sporting uh, facial hair. Um, Thomas Carlyle's Past and Present, published in 1843, described the beard worn by its hero, the medieval abbot Samson, on no fewer than four different occasions in the book, comparing him to the biblical strongman Samson, of course, whose masculine strength resided in his beard and vanished when it was cut off by the treacherous Delilah, as everyone in Victorian England uh, of religious uh, age uh, would know. Carlyle proclaimed a general need in his own book time for born champions, strong men, liberatory Samsons of this poor world, whom the Delilah world will not always share of their strength and eyesight. Our forefathers, proclaimed Charles Kingsley, were not ashamed of their beards. And as a militant Protestant, Kingsley condemned Catholicism, not least because its monks and friars went one step further than shaving their beards and shaved their heads as well. <coughs> In his Elizabethan story, uh, Westwood Ho, Kingsley actually calibrated his heroes and villains according to the length of their beard, the Jesuits being clear sha clean shaven, effete courtiers wearing little pointy beards or waxed moustaches, and only the hero, Amias Lee, equipped with the true segment signifier of uh, masculinity, the full length beard. And like everything else in Victorian Britain, beards, you can say, only really arrived when they began to be satirised in punch. And John uh, Lynch recognised them as relatively new in 1853 in his portrayal of a female traveller mistaking the sailors on her ships, on, on the ship she was travelling on, uh, with the new fashion of wearing a beard, mistaking them for brigands. It's the beard and moustache movement. And the, uh, uh, now, here, madam, is your, your luggage, says the railway guard, and the old lady uh, thinks that they're all, they're all brigands. Ideals of masculinity, like big game hunters or explorers or fashionable pioneers of alpine mountaineering, such as Albert Smith, uh, war beards may be of necessity. But their image is undoubtedly, I think, influential in spreading the fashion. Charles Dickens grew a beard. Uh, uh, there he is on the left uh, before and on the right after. The, the right hand one, of course, is the one we're familiar with. Joking that his friends liked it because they, it meant they saw less of him. And uh, so too, of course, did Thomas Carlyle, again, before and after there. Now, some justified their decision to become more hirsute on medical reasoning as the miasmatic theory of disease, dominant in mid-century, prom prompted the idea that the beard could be a kind of filter against dangerous and unhealthy vapours. But above all, as Alexander Rowland remarked in his essay on the beard, as a rule, every man with a beard is a man of strongly marked individuality, frequently genius, has formed his own opinions, is straightforward to a certain degree, frequently reckless, but will not fawn or cringe to any man. A beard made it easier for a man to present an impassive face to the world, avoiding the weak expressions of emotion that were characteristic, according to the ideas of mid-century, uh, of the female sex. It gave sternness, <coughs> dignity and strength to his appearance. 